idea of coming out and living authentically, that seemed so impossible that changing the world seemed more possible. Hey y'all, welcome back. Mom and Dr. Jones, OBGYN and Mom24. Today we have a really exciting guest, Senator-elect Sarah McBride from Delaware. She is 30 years old and recently made history by being elected as the first openly transgender senator elected to any state Senate in the United States. She is also a champion for healthcare and access and wants to make a difference and change the world. And I think she is well on her way to doing that. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm thrilled to have you chatting with us. Why don't you tell my audience who you are and why we're chatting today? Sure, well, it's, it's great to be with you. Um, my name is Sarah McBride. I am the newly elected state senator for Delaware's first state senate district. Um, and folks who don't live in Delaware may be wondering why you're, you're talking to me. Um, but when I was elected this past November, I became the first openly transgender state senator in the country and the highest ranking transgender elected official. Um, and I, I come to this work uh, after about 10 years working in LGBTQ equality at the Human Rights Campaign as their national press secretary fighting here in Delaware and nationally for equality for the LGBTQ community. And so I'm really excited to get to work on a whole host of issues as the new state senator for uh, Delaware's first district, which is the community I was born and raised in. And also, interestingly enough, the district that Joe Biden uh, grew up in when he moved here to Delaware. Oh, wow. So do you know the Biden family? I do. I do. Well, everyone in Delaware knows them. It's, it's a small state. We, uh, we, we, we see the Bidens at the grocery store, out to dinner. It's, it's really a, a tight-knit community. I had the fortune of uh, getting to know the Bidens really through uh, Joe's son, Bo, um, who was our state attorney general. I worked for Bo in 2006 and 2010 on his two campaigns. And he actually became a, a really close friend. Um, he was the real deal. He was as good and decent behind closed doors as he was out in, in public. And a lot of times with, um, with, with public figures where a mythology begins to develop, like the mythology sort of around Joe and, and Bo and their relationship, um, it's, it's, not, it's not a myth, it's real. Um, their love for one another was one of the most profound parent-child relationships that I've ever seen. Um, and, and I got to know the, the, the president-elect and Dr. Biden uh, in large part through Bo, and I've gotten to work with, with both of them uh, on LGBTQ equality. And actually, President-elect Joe Biden wrote the foreword to my book, Tomorrow Will Be Different, um, about my own journey and about my work uh, fighting for equality. I'll put the link in the description to your book in case anybody wants to check that out. Other than the fact that you're just really writing history with your life right now, I mean, you're going to be the top ranking, like you said, elected official who is openly transgender. In addition to that, you're very young to be a high-ranking political figure. So I want to hear a little bit, I mean, obviously I want to talk about your journey coming out and how your identity has affected your journey into and through politics, but I want to hear right now how you decided so early on that this was the path you wanted to take and how you got here. In many ways, my journey to coming out was wrapped up in my journey in politics and government and advocacy. At a, a really young age, I got involved because I saw that politics was the place where you can make the most amount of change for the most number of people in the most number of ways possible. It's the space where every avenue of society converges uh, and where you can have the, the greatest opportunity to make a difference. And that deep love and interest in, 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 in government and advocacy developed at a young age because at a young age, I began to be, I, I began to struggle with not just who I am, but how I fit into this world. And at a very young age, it became clear to me that there were many people in our society that didn't accept who I am, that there was a fact about me that could lead to not just prejudice, but discrimination or even violence. You know, it doesn't take long to, to realize that. All of society's messages at a very early age reinforce that rigidity of gender. You are expected to abide by a certain set of stereotypes that are assigned to you when you're born. As I began to, to struggle with that fact, as I began to struggle with who I am and, and whether the heart of my community was big enough to love someone like me, 
I also discovered history books and started reading about history and saw that every chapter in those history books was defined by people ranging from advocates, activists, everyday people to elected officials who worked in consort to deepen our understanding of we the people and to expand opportunity. That that was every single theme in every single chapter, that sort of arc of the moral universe, as Dr. King called it. And because of that, I thought, well, maybe I can get involved. And even if I can't live authentically, if I can create a world where other people can live fully and freely, even if I can't do it, it'll help to, to fill the void in my own life. It'll help to heal the pain that I was feeling being stuck in the closet. And perhaps if I can't live an authentic life, if I could live a meaningful life, it will compensate for that. And so I got involved at a really young age. I got involved with campaigns here in Delaware, including working for, for our former attorney general, the late Bo Biden. Um, and, and, I, and I saw how important government is. I saw how much of a difference you can make, but it was also in those experiences that I realized that as meaningful, as professionally fulfilling as it was to make a difference in my community, that those things wouldn't heal the pain. They wouldn't fill, fill the void in my life. Um, and so that was in many ways, the path toward me coming out was seeing that um, I couldn't rationalize away who I am. And the, the best way to make a difference, the only way to really make a difference and have a fulfilling life and a meaningful life is to live an authentic life. You touched on some really important things there. I mean, it just hurts my heart to hear you say that this was kind of a way for you to, if I can't live authentically, maybe I can help other people do that. And that's just, it, it's such an eye-opening insight into kind of the mind of someone who's going through that, that it, it feels almost, and correct me if I'm wrong, because it's not my lived experience, but it sounds as though you're saying it feels almost impossible when you're in that situation to tell other people how you're feeling. The idea of coming out and living authentically and having a, a happy life where I could find love and be loved, where I could find a community I loved, where I could do work that I loved, that seemed so impossible that changing the world seemed more possible. It's incredible. Um, one of the challenges we have when we're talking about trans identities is that most people who are straight can understand what it feels like to love and to lust. And so they're able to enter into conversations around sexual orientation with an analogous experience that allows them to build empathy and, 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 and support. The challenge for trans folks is that most people who aren't trans, cisgender, most people who are cisgender don't have a, an analogous experience to having a gender identity that differs from your sex assigned at birth. And so it's much more difficult to enter into the conversation because it's hard to wrap your mind around what that feels like to be in the closet and to be trans. And for me, the closest thing that I could compare it to was a constant feeling of homesickness, an unwavering ache in the pit of my stomach that would only go away when I could be seen and affirmed as myself. Um, and, and, and so yes, it, it seemed impossible. Um, growing up, the idea that you could live your truth and dream big dreams all at the same time was almost so impossible that it was practically incomprehensible. What do you think made you want to be so open about all of this? Because sitting here talking to you now, I feel like if you didn't want to talk about it, people probably wouldn't ask you about it, except if they just somehow knew your history, which seems like they only would know because you've been so open about it. So what has prompted you to be in the public eye, to be such a big public figure and still approach these issues that can be really divisive and maybe even make you worry that it would not help you with winning elections and things like that. I think a couple things. One, I, I had lived a, a sort of public enough life prior to coming out that there really wasn't much of a choice for me in terms of being because you Because you were how old when you finally? I was 21 and I had been involved very publicly in Delaware politics. I was student body president at my college, American University at the time. And, and so on the one hand, I, I came out and decided to do so publicly. One, I knew that people would talk about it and that it's much better to get your news out in your own words, on your own terms, 
it's difficult to hate someone whose story you know. And when I could get my my story out there, hopefully I could tap into what I have always believed and continue to be- believe is the most powerful human emotion when tapped, and that's empathy. It's inspiring because in the process of learning to be your authentic self and being able to openly be your authentic self, you say, you know, it felt like it was more plausible to change the world. But in actuality, now you're living your authentic self and you're actually changing the world through that. I mean, the fact that you're coming on and talking to me and my audience about that, you hit on something really that I feel deep in my soul is that it's very hard to hate someone when you know their story. And this is what leads me as a gynecologist who works in the deep South in the middle of Texas in a very conservative area to discuss things like abortion and to have people discuss those things with my audience is a goal of mine because you're very right what hearing stories is what helps us really touch base with that empathetic humanity rather than all the noise around us i also felt that i had a responsibility to use the privileges that i have the the privilege of of having a family that's accepting of having, you know, a campus community that, that I knew would embrace me and accept me of being white and, you know, economically and educationally privileged that I could use those privileges to, to, to bear the sort of burden of public education, if you will, um, to be open and, and to share my story, because I, I know that it's always in, it's in our stories that we have the power to, to open hearts and change minds. I was just tired of having secrets. Um, I had had such an overwhelming secret that weighed on me so tangibly for so much of my life that I was done worried about, you know, figuring out if the world knew something about me or could figure something out. And I just, I wanted to be done with those secrets. I also have come to the conclusion very early in my journey as, a, uh, as, as, a, as an out trans woman that I'm proud to be trans. Um, my mom asked me, you know, do you want to be known as Sarah the, the trans woman or Sarah the, the woman when I first came out? And, and my answer then and even more so now is I want to be known in all of my identities for my whole humanity and not to have any one of those identities serve as an asterisk on the other. Um, I want to be seen as Sarah who's trans and Sarah who's a woman and not have those as, as mutually exclusive points or identities. I think the only way we, we, we really in the long run allow people to be seen in our whole humanity is to not hide one part in order to be seen as the other, but to be able to be seen in our full humanity. And again, because I'm proud of all of those identities, I'm proud of who I am in my totality. And particularly, I'm proud of being trans. I think that's really amazing. And I want to know a little bit about your journey into politics and kind of what some of your goals are as senator when you get sworn in in the Delaware Senate. You know, from the start of this campaign, I said that I wanted to serve as the healthcare senator and the paid leave senator. Healthcare is uh, very personal for me, as it is for for so many. Uh, Just to give a little background, the most formative experience in my life isn't my gender identity. It wasn't coming out. It was my relationship with with my husband, Andy. I met Andy, who was a transgender man, um, when we were fighting for equality and we fell in love. He was the most generous, one of the kindest people I've ever met. He was brilliant. More than that, he was goofy, uh, <laughs> which is which is the top thing I'm looking for um, in a in a in a life partner. And he uh, he and I met each other. We bumped into each other at a White House Pride reception in 2012, right after I'd come out. And he followed up on Facebook with me, and he said he thought we'd get along swimmingly. And I thought, who the hell says the word swimmingly? Clearly, someone I want to spend time with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> particularly someone who's in their 20s that says the word swimmingly. So we went out on a date and, and fell in love really quickly. About a year into our relationship, Andy was diagnosed with cancer. And he was lucky enough to have health insurance. And we were both lucky enough to have an employer that was flexible. We were working at the same place at that time that allowed us to, to really focus on his care without having to sacrifice our income. He was lucky enough to, to get chemotherapy, radiation, undergo surgery, he got a clean bill of health. And then about eight months later, he received the news that every single cancer patient fears. His cancer was back, it had spread, and for him it was terminal. And so when he didn't have much time left, Andy asked me to marry him. And of course the answer was yes. And we married on the rooftop of our apartment building in August of 2014. And then just 
four days after that, he passed away. That experience and my relationship with him left me profoundly changed. Um, it, it showed me how to love and be loved our relationship. Uh, our relationship and, and Andy in particular demonstrated to me how to live the values I fight for at work in my own life. But more than anything else, my relationship with Andy showed me that change cannot come fast enough and that every single day matters when it comes to building a world where every person can live their life to the fullest. And Andy spent his life advocating for more people to be able to get the care that they need. Um, he was an attorney really focused on the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and so that experience, both Andy's work and his legacy, but also his life, showed me just how important the ability to get care is and just how important it is for us to be able to get the support we need when we hit hard times. I am now the, the new chair of the State Senate Health and Social Services Committee. Um, and for me, my priorities will focus on, one, making sure that we're continuing the quality care that Delawareans need, but also making it more affordable, lowering the cost of premiums, out-of-pocket expenses, lower, lowering deductibles, making sure that pe people don't have to sacrifice their financial security in order to get care. But we also know that that financial security and the, the, the economic toll of being able to get care isn't limited to the cost of, of insurance or treatment. It's also the economic toll that people face because they have to take time off work. So many people have to choose between getting by and getting well. And at the end of the day, as we've seen through this pandemic, no one should have to lose their income in the face of illness. And so for me, one of the, the major priorities moving forward is to ensure that Delaware joins the growing list of states that guarantee paid family and medical leave for, for every person. So that whether you're welcoming a new child into your family, whether you're struggling through an illness or whether you're taking care of a loved one, um, that you don't have to sacrifice your financial security for your, for your health. All those things are so important and, and stuff I see every single day. I mean, my own personal experience in going back to work very quickly after having babies, but also in my patients who I had the benefit of at least being financially and socially stable, but I have patients who are in just absolutely unimaginable positions when they have a baby or they need surgery that they should really be out for six weeks. And they say, doc, listen, I, I can't, I don't, I won't be able to pay my rent. I will be homeless if I take six weeks off of this surgery. And they're left really choosing between their social and mental health and their physical health, which often overlap so distinctly. So I think that's a really important point as well. It is a right to have health care, and it is also a right to be able to continue living your life when something interrupts your, your health in general. And you're right, the pandemic has brought all of that to the forefront and made it so much more obvious how important these things are. So I appreciate that that's something that you're passionate about because it affects so many people every day. Your story about Andy is really beautiful and I can't imagine going through that. You've been through a lot. I think some of the people listening to this will probably be around the same age as you. I'm only a few years older than you. And I can't imagine having gone through both losing my husband and the journey that you've had and becoming a politician and, and being elected to the state Senate at such a young age. So congratulations. It is a true story of overcoming. If you have someone watching this, there's two people really that I want you to tell something to. And the first of those people is if there is someone in the LGBTQ plus community who is watching this and has goals similar to yours or even totally different than yours, but feels like their identity might interrupt their ability to do those things. What would you say to them being on this side of that? I struggled with that and, and the fear that my dreams and my identity were mutually exclusive kept me inside of myself for much of my life. But I have seen over the last 10 years, both in my advocacy work, but now obviously in the context of this past campaign and, and my opportunity to serve, that the only things that are truly impossible are the things we don't try. And that the story of our community is the story of us individually and collectively transforming impossibility into possibility into reality. And there are so many things today from the trans youth who are living their truth and dreaming big dreams all at the same time to the trans people who are 
able to succeed in, in, in so many different fields from art and entertainment to, to business, to politics, to academia, that we have as a community helped to transform impossibility into possibility, into reality. We've shown that change is possible. And we've shown that the only limitation on our capacity to create change and to pursue our dreams is the limitation of our own imagination. And so know that as impossible as something may seem right now, throughout our history, throughout the last two decades, dreams and change that seemed so impossible that they were incomprehensible are now a reality. And if we've done it before, then we can do it again. You can do it too. I think you are going to help a lot of people. And I know you do a ton of interviews. I think my audience on YouTube is probably a bit different than some of the people who watch those. And I think the impact of you being here and talking to my audience here is going to be extremely valuable. So I appreciate that. If someone is watching and I don't like to group people into boxes, but maybe kind of feels like they don't really understand trans people so well, or maybe their first time ever really knowing of somebody and hearing them speak openly about being transgender um, is right now. What would you tell them about how to be more accepting, how to learn more and how to interact with people they may come through in their daily life that are different than they are? There's no one who is able to understand what it feels like to be in everyone else's shoes. And just because we don't necessarily understand something, just because we can't wrap our mind around another person's experience doesn't mean that their experience isn't real, that their identities aren't worthy of being validated and that they aren't worthy of being treated with respect. So one, I think sometimes we get so caught up on our inability to understand that, that, that we, we cease to recognize that behind this conversation, behind the concepts are real people who love and laugh, who hope and dream, who fear and cry just like everyone else. The second thing I'd say is that you're gonna make mistakes. We all make mistakes, we're human. And being kind and decent doesn't mean that you get everything right from the start, it means that you try. Sometimes kindness does require intentionality. Sometimes kindness does require effort. And there are things that you may have to relearn or unlearn. There are, we are all on a journey together. And the important thing to understand is that so long as you demonstrate a desire and a willingness and an effort to grow, people are usually willing to extend grace. And so that I think is so important to, to not be so afraid of doing the wrong thing that you don't do anything um, but to, to recognize that when you make a mistake, just apologize, correct, and move on and try to do better. The other thing is sometimes we, 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 we sort of give ourselves a get out of free jail, uh, get out of jail free card, right? We're like, I'm, I'm, I'm good. My heart is pure. Um, but no, it does require some intentionality. It does require effort. But again, as long as you demonstrate growth, most people are willing to, to, to extend grace. And then the final thing I'd, I'd say is to, to search for resources. There are a lot of resources out there that educate, that invite people in to a, a trans person's experience to their life. Um, writers from authors from Janet Mock to, to um, Jenny Boylan. Um, like I mentioned, I, I've written a book, so I also would recommend that one. <laughs> and we will um, link it below. <laughs> But th there are so many, um, there are so many resources available and to proactively seek out those resources because they will help to uh, uh, deepen your understanding and open your heart even further. But again, it doesn't require to be an ex it doesn't require you to be an expert. It doesn't require you to get everything, to just be kind, to just show someone respect, to, to treat them as they wish to be treated, just as you wish to be treated as you would like to be treated. And so I think those are, I think just the guardrails um, that, that people should, should, should abide by, whether we're talking about trans rights, LGBTQ equality, or, or really any difference. Because at the end of the day, true compassion isn't a person who can find support and, and, and empathy for someone who's the same as them in every single way, but one or two. It's our ability to find support and love for someone who 
is different than us, us in every single way, but but one, our, our shared humanity. To, pe- to find that support for people who that difference is not a little stream, but an ocean. Um, and that's, I think, humanity at its best. And that's that's compassion and empathy at their at their truest in their truest form. Yeah, I love that. And and it's such good advice. You know, I I have spent the last year really reevaluating as a healthcare provider how I am making my healthcare environment more inclusive because particularly in gynecology, it tends to be this is women's health. And then I started getting comments on YouTube like maybe you could use more inclusive language. And I have to admit my knee jerk reaction was okay, but most of the people I see are women. And once I started really considering it, I thought, well, why was that my knee jerk reaction? What made me feel that way? Was it because it was just a new idea? And I made just the tiniest of efforts to do that. And I was swarmed with people saying, this is making a difference in my life. I can listen to your videos without feeling dysphoric. And it only took that, that one little of me challenging how I felt in my brain initially and making the tiniest of efforts. Honestly, it shouldn't even be called an effort. It was very minimal. And people saying, this changes things for me. And I took a deep dive a year ago into transgender health and the care for trans people and you know the challenges you face in getting care, particularly trans and non-binary men and getting gynecologic care because it tends to be such a gendered specialty. And this has become something that I'm really passionate about providing information to other healthcare providers. How can we make our, you know, uh, places of work more inclusive? And this interview isn't about me, but before we close, I would say, if I can just tap into your brain for a minute, is there anything you would tell healthcare providers about things that have made a difference in your healthcare, things that have been made to feel more inclusive or made you more comfortable when you go to the doctor? I think a lot of times when we talk about LGBTQ people and, and particularly trans folks in care, we talk about transition related care. And that is obviously a, 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 a large source of barriers and discrimination that trans people face in, in healthcare. But to your point, the challenges that trans people face in broader care um, from uh, you know access to a gynecologist to treatment for cancer there is this perpetual fear. Is this provider, is this clinician, someone who embraces and affirms trans people or, or doesn't? And the, the fear for as, as good as the vast majority of clinicians are, the fear that could this person's personal prejudice result even subconsciously in substandard care? Because we know the data is clear that that it that it can and it does, yeah. right? And and that fear, the the anxiety and the stress that comes navigating the healthcare system. Period. Navigating particularly serious illness. Period is overwhelming. But then to throw on top of that the fear that could come with discrimination that that might look or lurk around any corner. That gets in the way of of a patient or or a caregiver being able to really focus on the job ahead of them of of, of trying to get well, of taking care of their health. Um, I know for Andy, there was that constant fear in the back of of our minds. You know, will the next you know physician or or will the next nurse, as great as the care was, could that next person not support and embrace trans folks? And so that fear is real and, and, and it, it has a tangible impact on, on our actual physical health outcomes when you're struggling with that fear, when you have that distraction getting in the way of our ability to, to, to get better and to, to stay well. Um, and so it, it's just so important that no matter the care you're providing to be thinking, how am I sending the message that this is an affirming inclusive space? You know, it, it, it could be anything from, you know, going through LGBTQ co- cultural competency training and, and, and making clear that, that you're an ally. Um, it, it, could be, it could be a step as simple and straightforward as that. But it's so important that no matter the care, you recognize that trans people are going to be accessing that care. They need that care. And no matter how good and decent you are as a person and you know you are, the, 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 the new patient isn't going to necessarily know that. 
and and it, and it's helpful to to try to make it clear subtly, not you know, hey, you're trans, don't worry, I'm an ally, you know, but subtly sort of make clear those values. I think makes a world of difference for a patient, particularly when they're entering a new space. Yeah, that's great advice. And I appreciate you being willing to kind of share your experience and Andy's experience as well, because these are the kind of things that help change healthcare and that help us understand some, you know, this should be an area of better training in medical school and particularly in my opinion in gynecology and pregnancy training because it's not and it needs to be. And so that's kind of one of my other missions as well is to help improve that. And I appreciate having, you know, interviews like this to refer back to when we're having those discussions. So, all right, I don't wanna keep you too long. I know you're super busy. I really appreciate you being here today. Is there anything else that you want to add? Where can my followers find you on the internet if they would like to learn more or follow your journey? I would love people to, 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 to follow along. Follow me on Twitter at Sarah E. McBride. Instagram at Sarah E. McBride. Facebook at either Sarah McBride or Send Sarah McBride, which is my official Senate page. <laughs> um, and you can follow along with what I'm doing there, the work ahead of us, and certainly be in touch with me there. Those will be linked in the description box below. If you're not subscribed and you'd like to be, I'd love for you to help me meet a milestone of 700K by my two year anniversary of uploading obstetrics and gynecology and personal stories to to this channel. Be kind to yourself, to each other, to me. In the comments, be kind, and I will see you next time.